So last week, we talked about a challenging message about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and not just a fan. Not somebody who just acknowledges that Jesus is a good guy, but somebody who says, I am passionately following Jesus with all of my heart and my soul. And it's interesting, when I give a very challenging message, there are some people that are like, yeah, pastor, give it to us hot, we like that. And there's some people that just look at me on the way out like, seriously? Or maybe more like, I'm not sure I was comfortable with that. And uh, I I tell you, one of the jobs of the pastor is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So (laughs) apparently I was doing my job. And now we're going to talk this weekend about what does that mean to be a disciple of Jesus, but what does that mean in my real daily life, in the local context, in how do I relate to the church family, how do I relate? And we're talking about how do we deepen and clarify what we are committed to. And last week I told you that your life is formed by the commitments you make and keep. And I absolutely believe that. To say these are some decisions I've made, some things I've decided to be, that who I want to be, what I want to do, who I am committed to, that those decisions will largely shape your life. And the obverse is also true. The commitments you don't make will also shape your life, sometimes by the absence of important things. And last week we talked about being committed to Jesus. What does it mean that he's such a great savior and he gave his life for me and out of a deep understanding that that is how I find eternal life and truth and hope, that that's where salvation comes from, then my deepest response, and Jesus makes some strong statements. If you don't love me more than your stuff, if you don't love me more than your family, if you don't love me more than, than your plans and ambitions, then you can't be my disciple. And we sometimes say people, come to Jesus and believe in him and it'll make your life better. But we have this deep problem is we have a tendency to think it's all about me instead of it's really about Jesus. And so if I'm committed to Christ, then I'm committed to his cause. That means the most important thing is that people who are in darkness come to light, that people who don't know about Jesus find that out, that people who are struggling and stuck, that they need to get going in their spiritual journey. And everybody gets stuck at different points. So if I'm committed to Christ, then I'm committed to his cause, and here's the step I wanna take you on this weekend. Then I am committed to his church, because that's the visible expression of what God is doing here on, on the earth. And I invited a neighbor of mine to church one time and I was trying to encourage him to come and he said, Paul, no offense, I haven't given up on God, but I've given up on his people. And I really think he'd given up on God too, but that was his his statement. And sometimes when you think of the church, you think of a little organization or a building or a program, and maybe you think of something that's outmoded or you think of something that was hurtful to you, but we need a bigger picture of the church. Jesus Christ said, the church is my body. That is, Jesus was active in bringing truth and light and hope when he was here on earth. So now we are doing that, that we are his body here on earth. And and Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. That it's gonna be unstoppable, it's gonna be transforming. And I tell you, I absolutely believe that the local church is the only hope of the world that there's nobody else bringing truth and light and hope. And so we have an incredibly wonderful calling, an incredibly high and holy work. But that has to boil down into how do we actually deal with each other? There's a little poem that says, Oh, to live above with the saints that we love, ah, that will be glory. But to live here below with the saints that we know, now that's a different story. You see, somehow this high and holy vision has to come down to what I actually do with my life and my week. And my desire and my hope in this series is that we deepen and clarify and make your commitment to Christ more practical and more real. That you make some personal commitments out of wherever you are in that spiritual journey. And I want to read to us from Acts chapter 2. And I want to ask the question, what is the church supposed to be? What are we committing to? And What are we at Family Church striving to become? And I think it's a wonderful picture in Acts chapter two. 
because it's right after Jesus has gone back to heaven, uh, the Holy Spirit has come, Peter has preached a great message, and we have thousands of people, literally, who have come to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the hope of the world. How many churches are there in the world at that point? There's one mega church in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Christian Church, that's it. And you know what they're tasked with? To tell the story about Jesus to all the peoples of the world. Can you imagine an overwhelming vision? An overwhelming mission? And they were together, and they had other problems too. People had come from far distant lands to Israel, to Jerusalem, to worship God, and they had now come to believe in Jesus, and they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and so they wanted to stay there. And they left their homes and their jobs, and they left all of their, they, they came for a short trip, and they stayed for months. And so some of them were without money and without food, and they all of a sudden were in crisis. So you think, oh, it would have been exciting to be part of that church. I tell you, it would have been a disaster. A church that grows super fast, has no organization, has people that are starving, and besides that, oh yeah, there's persecution coming. So they didn't have a church with no problems, but they had a church with great passion. And I want to read to you what they were about in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And this is the heart of what every church should be. Not the same program, not the same events, but the heart of what every church should be. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So just a couple of words I want to draw out of that. First of all, it says they devoted themselves. Devoted is another word for a divine commitment. This is something that I believe in, I'm passionate about. It's something that I am not going to be easily pushed off of. And I, and I tell you, that's the measure of commitment, is what does it take to make you quit? What does it take to make you give up? What does it take to distract you? And it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the heart and core is that they were following what we have in the New Testament now, the teaching of the apostles as well as the fact that the apostles were leading and directing that one church there in Jerusalem. And then it says they, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. You know, there, there's a clarity that the first important commandment is to love God with everything we've got. The second commandment is to love each other. And particularly, Jesus said that the church will be an example of who Jesus is by the way that we love and care for each other. That, that fellowship, that deep relationships. And then to the breaking of bread, and I believe this breaking of the bread is that communion where you sit and remember the body and blood of Christ, where you remember what it is that he's done for us, and you again relive that, that reason why we've come to such a great Savior and what he's done for us. And then it says, and to prayer. So they devoted themselves to these core activities that were a critical part of how the church moved forward. Now, the other side of it is we at Family Church, we have what we call church membership or how to be part of the team. And we encourage people to come no matter who you are, where you are, what you believe, what you're doing, we want you to be here. The, the door is wide open on the weekend. But we want you to grow and mature and come to follow Christ. And, and so then there is a, a process by which we say, are you really with us? Are you clear about what we believe and where we're going? And, and there's a narrower door that's called membership or being a part of that. And some people react to that and they say, I'm not sure membership is a thing. And, and I just would note at the end of this, as we talk about what does it mean to make your commitment deeper, as we talk about what does it mean to make your commitments clear, that in that New Testament story, when we're talking about all of them together, it says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm not sure who it was, but somebody was counting. Somebody was clear about, are you now in, or are you still on the outside? And I think that probably became incredibly important when persecution came in the next few chapters, and they scattered all over the world, literally. 
And everywhere they went, they started a church. Everywhere those coals went from the fire, they started a new fire. And so there was this clear picture of we are a team together and we are committed to each other and we are connected to each other. And so what does that mean in our context? What does that actually look like? And, and I want to help you think about what does it mean to make your commitment deeper? And I want to make this analogy that it's like a lot of relationships. When we come to the church family, we often come because we have needs. Sometimes it's because we're kind of lonely and we're looking for fellow believers. Sometimes we've got children and we hope there's a good children's ministry or youth and we hope there's a good student ministry. We, we hope there's something there that will fit. And last week we asked you, what were some of those things that caused you to want to come or what were you looking for when you came looking for a church, a family church? And so from various campuses, we got all kinds of responses and amazingly, they were very similar. And I have to tell you, I'm encouraged how highly the idea of teaching from the word of God, that came up in almost everybody's statement. And, and I appreciate that, that that's what you are committed to and that's what we are looking for. And then there were lots of additional things on beyond that. So let me read a couple of them to you. So important to newcomers, as I was in 97, I was looking for friendly people, people who remembered my name the next week I came, a sermon that spoke to me everything that I was going through. Somebody else wrote, a place where I can be fed, a place where I belong, a place that feels like home. A sense of walking into my home, to my faith, to my family when I walk through the doors. And I thought this was a good summary. A place we're looking, we were looking for a church where it was a place to grow, a place to serve, a place to be equipped to be like Jesus, a like-minded church family to minister to and to be ministered to. So there are lots of reasons people come and generally when we start with, we're looking for something that will meet a need in our lives. And obviously, there's lots of churches that could meet some of those needs, but you're looking for a special fit that would make a fit for you at your stage in your spiritual journey, at your uh, stage in your family life development. And so we often come with needs. And, and I remember a guy that told me years ago, he said, you know, I feel embarrassed, Paul. He said, I've known about God all my life, but I never came to church, and now my life has fallen apart, and I need help, and, I need, and that's when I come to church. He said, I feel a little embarrassed that I'm only coming here because now I have needs. And I said, welcome to the group. That's what most of us, that's our story. That's how we get here. But I want you to deepen beyond that. So let me challenge you a little bit. What is it that attracts this young couple to each other? Oh, your skin is so soft. <laughs> I love the way your hair smells. You make me laugh. He has a hot car. <laughs> I love those six-pack abs he's got. Now let me give you a contrast. What attracts this couple that's different than what attracts this couple? This couple has been married for 50 years. Her skin's not quite as soft as it was. That hot rod's gone a long time ago. If she loved him for his hair, that might have been a passing thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? That there's nothing wrong with what attracts a young couple to each other. It's just shallow. And over the years, some of that will change. And the question, and the sad thing in our culture is like, we've just grown apart. So that means you were attracted to the wrong things and you didn't get the right things and you're not growing together. And I, and I always love that statement. It's like, I don't love her anymore. And you think, so why did you quit? And we have this idea in relationships. Sadly enough, most of the time, relationships get started because I have a need and somehow you make me feel better. And really, it's all about me. And hopefully, over the years, you grow and you deepen and you begin to, to hold up and love the things that are deeper and more important, the things that are lasting and I, uh, I did a double funeral yesterday, and there is nothing like a funeral to remind you how easily we focus on the things that do not matter and do not last, how torqued out we get about stuff that doesn't really count. 
and sometimes how we neglect the things that really do count, the things that matter and the things that last. So I think that this is a good picture that says, what does it mean for us to be more deep in our commitment to Christ and to deepen in our commitment to a church family? And I think this is a great illustration that when we come, first of all, to a church family, we often are attracted by lower story things. We're attracted by things that often meet our needs at that time. And so we are often attracted by programs to begin with. And so you come to a church and you say, the important thing about this church is they have a great nursery. So how many years is that important to you? Depends on how many kids you got. I get that part. <laughs> you got seven kids, it might be a long time it's important to you. But you know, it's been a while since the nursery was really important to me. I mean, it's important to me for other people, but it's not that important unless my grandkids are there. That's, when you get older, the nursery gets important again. But you understand that programs change, your need for programs change, and if that's all that you're committed to, then when the program is done, you're done. And sadly, that's too often true. We are sometimes attracted to the personality, to a teacher or to a leader, and God works through people, and that is what he's done all the way through the scripture, and that's important, and God gives gifts, and God uses people, but we must never place an individual above the cause of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians, if you remember, Paul was writing to them, and he said to them, I'm really upset with you because some of you are saying, I'm of Paul, he's writing this, I'm of Peter, I'm following Apollos, and then the really spiritual one said, we follow Jesus. And what they were doing was picking individuals and dividing the church family. And he said, that is not spiritual maturity, that is immaturity. So we are, we are connected to personalities and people, and those are important. But when those change, does that change you? And I'll tell you a funny story. My grandma, who loved the Lord, went to church faithfully all her life, she told me when I was a teenager that she quit the church she was going to because the pastor grew a beard. <laughs> I'm testing, testing your, uh, your uh, commitment here. But I thought, how silly. I was trying as a young man to grow a beard at the time. And I thought, I'm pretty sure if you read the New Testament, Jesus had a beard, so I'm not sure how that's biblical. But it's sad to me why people quit churches and come to churches, because it's so shallow. Instead of saying, what are the deeper commitments? What are those deeper levels? I personally am praying for Redeemer's Fellowship in Roseburg, because they've just gone from a wonderful guy named Steve Walker, who's been a Bible teacher there for almost 30 years, I think, and they've just made a transition to a new guy, and that's an important church in our community. And I hope they do that well. And I hope they are more dedicated to Jesus than they are to Steve Walker. Because that's important how that church is impacting that community. And we need to be part of that same team together. And then sometimes I'm connected to people, which means the people I sit near, <laughs> that sit in the same section in the same service as me, <laughs> as 90% of you do. It also means the people in your Bible study, the people that are in your life group, and that's a wonderful thing. We want you to be deeply connected to each other. But what happens if they move? What happens if they go to a different church? What happens if something changes? Are you more connected to them or are you more connected to the cause of Christ and what he's doing? And then you also can see people who just want to be here. It's just a familiar place and something changes about the place. I tell you this is the truth. Somebody told me after they came and visited our church a few times years ago, I'm sorry, that mint green that you painted the auditorium, I just can't deal with that. I can't go to that church. Now that's a deep spiritual passion, isn't it? Seriously, I sat by him in a ball game about five years later and he said, have you repainted the church yet? <laughs> yes, but I wasn't gonna tell him that. So what we hope is that your, your commitment level it's not wrong to start shallow. Do you hear me clearly? It's not wrong to come because there's a great youth program and you have teenagers. <laughs> That's important. It's wrong if your commitment stays shallow. 
that as you grow mature in your spiritual journey, as you grow hopefully in your relationships in a church family, your commitment level and your clarity about why you're here should change. And it should go from it meets my needs to God is calling me here. This is a valuable place where God's making a difference in our community and lives are being changed at Family and Church. And because of that, I want to give myself wholeheartedly with my fellow servants here and make a difference in Douglas County. That's different than who's preaching, who's leading my class, how the building is painted, whether the pastor has a beard or not. You see, and and I believe that changes sometimes come to challenge and shake your commitment. So, what does it mean to be a, a part of a calling? It means that the mission is important. Ephesians 2.10 says that God has prepared good works in advance for us to do, that he has a purpose and a plan and a destiny for you. And part of that is being involved with a local community of believers who can challenge you and strengthen you. Christianity is not a solo sport. It is a cooperative thing, and if you don't know how much you need other people, then that's a definite arrogance on your part. If you don't know how much other people need you, then that's a selfishness on your part that we need each other, and we need each other to challenge and encourage and train up and correct and argue with sometimes and work together to make decisions. So the mission of Family Church has been stated in a simple phrase, people helping people find and follow Jesus. That's as basic as it gets. We want people to come and know who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, the only one who takes away the sin of the world, the only one who provides eternal life. And we want then to people to not just get baptized and join the church and quit. We want them to learn to grow and then follow Jesus, to become more than fans, but to become followers. And it's people helping people. So if we just said people finding Jesus and following Jesus, you would all think the pastor's supposed to do that. So this means everybody's a part of that. And I have to tell you some exciting things I've heard recently. There's some people actually that were leading life groups at Family Church and they quit their leadership function at that life group because they were starting a life group at their business. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if there were life groups in every school, if there were life groups in every mill, if there were life groups with the firefighters and with the police officers and there were life groups for people who were connected by their affinity and that we were reaching into the community because those people were, we were getting out of our holy bubble and getting into the world. And see, that's the idea, is that everybody is a part of helping people find and follow Jesus. And we are all committed to that task and that mission. And then the second part is our values. What are the things that we hold to be so important that we're gonna lift them up as values? And the problem with values is that they're always in competition with each other. So what's most important, what's least important? And over the next two weeks, we're gonna walk through this trim, which is the four values that we are hoping characterize us, or we want them to characterize us more and more. Transformation, lives being changed by Jesus as they come to find who Jesus is and then as they grow in that journey. Not just conform to people's expectations, not just living up to rules, but being transformed from the inside out. And that is often in the context of relationships as God works in our relationship to him and in our relationships to each other. And then innovation means we refuse to get stuck in a rut. That's why we've tried to do different things. Some of them work, some of them don't. We try to fail quickly so we can get on to the next idea. (laughs) It's why we have campuses. It's why we have Green and South Umpqua watching right now. It's why God is leading us to try different things because it's easy for churches to get stuck in a rut. And then we want to be involved in multiplication. Believers multiplying to more believers, groups multiplying to more groups, campuses multiplying to more campuses, churches multiplying to more churches, leaders multiplying more leaders. And so that's our values. Those are the things we hold, and I'm not gonna say much since we're spending the next two weeks on those. But that means this is what we are about. And my belief that the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. And the sad part is so many people get involved in all kinds of discussions over minor issues so that they create division, so that they break up the church, so the church becomes ineffective instead of being a mighty, unified, powerful force. So we believe that you need your mission, your values, and there has to be a sense of trust in the leadership. 
that there are godly people who have integrity, that are following the scriptures, that are following the spirit, that it's easy to say the church universal is led by the spirit, but the local church is led by people. And people make mistakes, and people are human, and people have different opinions. And so there's a process. So when I say that you have a calling here, it, believe, it means you believe that the mission is valuable, that the values we live by are important, that you trust the leadership, and so we're saying if that's true, give it all you got. We want to challenge you to be all in because I believe that we individually can do very little, but together we could be a powerful force in Douglas County. And I know that I want to be part of something bigger than just me. I want to be part of something that God is doing, something that is great, that's life-changing. And God is doing some amazing things. And we're inviting you to step in and to be deeper in your commitment to that. The, the reason we're doing that is for a number of reasons. But we want to build the momentum and the direction of the church. Because in the way that things work, probably within three to five years, neither Pastor Ed nor myself will be in the same roles of senior leadership that we are in now. We hope by God's grace that we'll be here at least part-time and be still involved in the body, but there is a time of changing over of leadership, and somebody said to me, Paul, you know when you leave, there's going to be a lot of people leave the church, and that made me sad, because I hope that's not true. I hope there's more to this than just the connection to an individual. I hope you believe God is on mission, that God's got family church on mission, and that you want to be a part of that, and you want to be a part of that, hopefully, for years in the future. So that's why we're challenging you. What's your commitment to? Is it to bottom story or is it to second story? Understand that's a mixed metaphor, deeper going to the second story, but stick with me. We want you to move from consumer to committed. And what does that mean? We're going to challenge you to step up in your relationship to saying, officially and formally, I am here, I am committed, I am connected, you can count on me. And part of the reason we have membership is because it clarifies things. You know you belong. You quit saying Paul's church or the church or family church and you start saying what? My church. My church. That's what we want it to be, your church. And you also, we know you're committed. We know that you've said, I'm here and we can count on you. It's not like, well, if it's a good week, maybe I'll come. If it's not a good week. You know, I was watching some folks come in this morning who are painfully slow getting from their car to coming in here, and they've made it all the way in to be part of service. And I thought, that's toughness. That's commitment. It's so easy to stay home, and when it's rainy and cold, and, and the atmospheric pressure on the, on the blankets on your bed is so high. <laughs> and so we're challenging you to step up. What does that mean? We're going to challenge you to make your commitment clear. We have something brand new that we have put out that's called the Membership Commitment, and we've been using this in our Connect class for years, but I realize people sign it. If they become members, it's stuck in a book somewhere, and they never look at it again. It's not something that's a constantly reminder to what am I here for, and why, why am I here, and what am I doing? And so we've rewritten it around the TRIM, and so we're going to challenge you as you walk out of the auditorium today, we're going to challenge you at all three campuses to pick up one of those and to prayerfully look at that and say, God, can I commit myself to this? And what we're looking for is somebody who has a personal relationship with Christ. That's critical to be part of the team, that you understand that. Somebody who can accept our beliefs and strategies. You understand that the further you grow in your intellectual and theological understanding, the fewer people you will agree with 100%. And I'm encouraging you to grow in your spiritual belief and then get over it. Not to let the details of what you believe divide you from the people you need to serve with. There are some deeply held beliefs that you better find people that believe like you so you can be completely unified. There's a lot of things that you say, yes, I believe that we're following the scripture, it's close enough, Paul can apologize to me when we get to heaven, it'll be good, I'll hold on till then. And, you know, I, my mom tells me the church I was in as a little boy that there were two old guys in every Sunday school class, no matter where the material started, they end up arguing about eternal security. One was for and one was against. And every single Sunday school class for years 
That's what they argued about. Doesn't that edify you? Doesn't that cause you to grow and be encouraged? You know, it's like we need to say there's a people that are lost and dying in the world and they need Jesus and they need the church to get clear about why we're here and what we're doing instead of being arguing and trying to be righter than everybody else. It says every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. How often do they have church? Yeah. And it's interesting, our life groups are now on almost every day of the week and all kinds of times we're meeting all over the place. And then it says we need to, first of all, come to faith in Christ, to believe together, attend regularly. It's interesting, I was reading an article that says church attendance has dropped almost 20%, not because people have quit, just because they've quit coming as often. And my joke as a pastor is I wish people came as often as they say they do. And that idea that says how important is it to me on a weekly basis as a part of my weekly schedule. And then somebody who's willing to build relationships That's the essence of our church family, to be connected, to love each other, to care for each other. And what I'm saying is there will be hurt feelings, there will be disagreements, there will be differences of opinion, and you've got to learn to work through those things. You can watch a TV pastor as a part of Bedside Baptist and never have a disagreement, but you will also be dwarfed in your growing. You will also be stunted in your spiritual development because it's all about relationships And it says, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And I don't know if you noticed, it says break bread twice. And the first one I think was a remembrance of Christ and of who he is to us. And the second thing was just good grub in somebody's home. You know how you know somebody better when you've been in their house and you've eaten together? And it's talking about the way that they care about each other, that they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And that's a wonderful thing, and a lot of the life groups do that as well. But just getting to know each other, just caring for each other. And then it says, they sold property and possessions and gave to anybody who had a need. So the, the next part about being a team member says, I'm, I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give of my time and my talents, my finances. I'm willing to give. And we've been talking about how generous you guys have been, especially through the last part of this last year. But that's the spirit. Your, your spiritual maturity is definitely connected to your pocketbook. Jesus said, where your heart is, there will your treasure be. And quite often in our culture, your time is a greater treasure even than your money. But we'll give to, as is needed in the church family. And I'm going to give out of my calling to the cause. And then the last one is to prayerfully support the leaders. There are no perfect leaders and there are no perfect churches. If you find one, please don't join it. You will screw it up, okay? (laughs) But there are sincere leaders who are trying to lead biblically and in a godly way, and we encourage you to find people you can trust and then to trust them wholeheartedly. So those six things talk about what does it mean to be a team member. And so we are making you a challenge to say, what is your commitment level? What is your commitment to? And in this beginning of this year, 2020, we would like the whole church family to consider, what am I gonna make my life shaped by? The things that I'm committed to, that I follow through with. And we hope that being a part of family church and believing that God is going to work here, and I believe there are greater things coming in the future than we've already seen. And God's already done some amazing things here. And if you believe that, then I would invite you to also take this home and to think about it prayerfully and carefully. And if you're already a member, to re-up. And if you're not yet a member, that you would seriously consider that. I'm going to hand off to the other two campuses. And uh, it's Green and South Umqua as you guys walk through these last two parts. Love you guys. So, next two steps are very simply what I mentioned. That if you're a follower of Jesus and you've decided that family church is your home and you've already gone through the process of going to the connecting class and having a conversation with one of the elders, that you simply take a look at that paper as you walk out and you prayerfully consider, does this embody what the New Testament talks about of being a living, active, connected fellowship? And can I be a part of that? And can I believe that God has called me here? And can I believe that this is what I'm supposed to do? And so that... That commitment you may have made 15, 20. There's some people here that were here when I came. They've been here 35 years or more. 
and they're staying through and they're following Christ. And so we're just asking you to relook at that and say, yep, still true. We handed this out at the All Church meeting in December and just to give people a look and say, is there anything you think we should change? How's the wording and all that? And uh, several people just signed it and handed it back to me. <laughs> it's like, okay, there's the early adopters. I guess we got that part. But I want you to wrestle with this and pray about it and think about it. And I also would like to challenge those of you who have never been a part of a church membership or you've not been a part of family church, I would really like you to consider what the purpose of it is, what it says to us, what it says to you, and particularly, is God called you here? And if God's called you here, then let's get after it. Let's pull together and really make a difference. Uh, I had somebody who had come to church for a while, they had dropped out, they were coming back, and they said, I think I'm gonna come back to your church, Paul. And, and I had a rare prophetic moment. I said, I hope you come back because God's called you to, not just because you think we have a better program. And I think that's really the truth because that's really the people that last. That's really the people that matter because God can do more through a small group of committed followers who are unified and serving together than again through thousands of people who are complacent fans. And so I would challenge you this year to deepen your commitment to Christ to deep your commitment to his cause and to deepen your commitment to his church and that that will make a huge difference as we move forward. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for how patient you are, how you work with us when we're such knotheads so often and we get stubborn and we get selfish and we get shallow and we get stuck. And God, thank you that you lovingly challenge us and bump us along and make us look at ourselves. And God, if, if there's any pride, if there's any division, if there's any resentment, we ask that you would melt that and you would make us, God, a unified church like that church in Jerusalem that remembered you and was devoted to you and then cared for each other, sacrificially even, and were on mission, not on vacation. And God, I know that you've called us all to the task of winning the world for you. And I pray that you would individually challenge our hearts, that we would say, yes, God, I'm gonna follow you, and I understand what it means. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're so glad you've joined us online, and uh, I, I have to tell you, I've been touched by, I've been reading some of the comments that you've made on Facebook and, and uh, that have come in through our website. And I'm so glad that it's a place where you can come and find spiritual encouragement and nourishment. And several of you mentioned that you were, you know, you were out of commission because of sickness or uh, you had a, some kind of an injury or an operation. And, I, and we're so glad to be able to bring this to you. And I, I hope it makes you feel like you are connected to, not only to God through the, the worship and the, and the scripture, but also to us at Family Church. And uh, if you're in a place where you don't have a church family and this is your only way of getting it, we're really glad to connect with you this way. And, and so I wanna say that clearly, but I also wanna encourage if you're near us, um, boy, we would love to see you in person. We would love to be able to give you a hug, love to be able to hear what's going on in your life, um, to be a part of this process of, of seeing God transform our lives together as we share and as we deeply enter into relationship. And, and so uh, I don't wanna, make this feel like nagging. I just want to be a challenge that I hope this series does cause your commitment to deepen and that it commits you to Christ more and it commits you to his church more. And, and because of that, it makes you want to be here in person more if you can be. So thanks for listening. Hope that God uses this to challenge you and to deepen your relationship with him and with us. Uh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs>